this model, model five of the social policy for development planners force in 2022 is concerned with the ideas of social protection. It's multiple meanings, uses, and diverse types. While it is not unusual to find some writers refer to social protection and social policy, within the framework of the Social Policy for Development Planners course, social protection refers to the instruments that address the protection task of social policy. In the specific context of the model, we will elaborate on the nature and diversity of social policy instruments, explore the two dominant approaches to social protection within the international and Africa and African discussion of the term, and examine the implications of the different approaches for mitigating vulnerability. Following this, we explored social protection responses to the COVID-19 pandemic in, in the African context. In doing so, we used the cases um, of a number of countries uh, response to the pandemic in setting out the lessons that need to be learned for a post-pandemic era and the recovery from the pandemic for a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable era. We use this to reiterate a running theme in this course, the imperative of a comprehensive social policy approach that aligns with national and regional development objectives and concerns. In its 2010 flagship publication, Combating Poverty and Inequality, the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development argues that, I quote, protecting people from the vagaries of the market and life's changing circumstances is one of the main objectives of social policy. As a key component of social policy, social protection is concerned with preventing, managing, and overcoming situations that adversely affect people's well-being." End of quote. While it is not uncommon to hear some use social policy and social protection interchangeably, it is important to have a more precise understanding of this of their relationship. Using the analogy of the nested Russian door, social policy is the big door. Social protection as a component of social protection or social policy will be the middle or smaller door. And social assistance, a non-contributory social provisioning support offered by the public authorities will stand for the smallest door. In this sense, social assistance is a component of social protection, while social protection is a component of social policy. Social protection measures are those instruments used to activate the protection task of social policy. Social protection schemes and programs are designed to reduce and respond to vulnerabilities either ex post, in other words, after the occurrence of the events that make people vulnerable, or ex ante, in other words, before the vulnerability occurs. Social protection schemes seek to reduce people's exposure to risk or respond to the risks where this could not be predicted and enhance people's capacity to manage the economic and social risks. Often this could be in the form of income loss due to unemployment, social exclusion, illness, disability, and old age. There are additional risks that make people vulnerable, such as external shocks like weather, events, the pandemic, and so on and so forth. The promotion of efficient labor market and active labor market policies are other types of social protection measures that are designed to prevent or mitigate poverty 
of vulnerability. How social protection instruments are managed and structured will depend on the underlying norms that frame the prevalent social policy regime in a country or territory. Keeping in mind the previous discussions in modules two and three, we can think of this in terms of the following. One, what mechanisms frame the provisioning of social protection schemes? In other words, whether social protection schemes are provided in the context of public institutional arrangement left to the market or designed to be delivered based on market principles or something to be provided for within the family framework. Each of these will matter for the nature and the framework of the social protection schemes. Two, the coverage principles principle governs the provision of social, what coverage principles govern the provision of social protection schemes? Are they provided to everyone without discrimination? Or is the provision framed by the norms of targeting? This also relates to what we may refer to as coverage structure, which will involve whether the social protection regime is intended to address all the circumstances of life and vagaries of the market that may leave people vulnerable to risks of income loss. In this case, the question relates to whether the social protection regime is designed to be encompassing, in other words, throughout the changing circumstances of life within the framework of a tax-funded or social insurance-based provision, or the intention is that public support only, public support is provided only in cases of market failure. In other words, is the social policy framework, social protection framework residual? Three, an important aspect to consider is the generosity of the social protection scheme, especially in the, in the context of income replacement. What is the level of income replacement that is provided, say, in retirement during the periods of unemployment, income loss as a result of illness, or unforeseen external shocks such as a pandemic. We now move to look at the types of social protection measures. What is not uncommon to hear, while it is not uncommon to hear some use social protection and social policy interchangeably, it is important to have a precise understanding of the relationship. Such analogy of the nested doll is what we had referred to earlier on. Social protection schemes can be in three broad categories. First is the social is, is social insurance intended to cover a range of needs from illness to unemployment and old age. Contributions are usually mandatory and may be linked to employment and contributions related to any level. In the cases of the latter, in other words, where contribution is related to any levels of the individual, this may involve contributions by employers and by individual employees. The scheme or social insurance fund may be managed by the social partners or nationally. Social insurance often work on the principle of risk sharing and risk pooling. This is an important differentiating factor from individual or private insurance, even when mandated by legislations. Most private insurance may be voluntary, but in case of mandatory individual insurance, Risks are individualized. An example would be market-based defined contribution schemes based on individual pension accounts. In contrast, a pension scheme based on social insurance will be defined benefits 
in nature and involve risk pooling. Social assistance or safety net schemes are generally non-contributory schemes or programs that offer public support in response to social and economic vulnerability. Most common social assistance schemes are tax funded, in other words, from the general fiscals. Although in several African countries, many of these schemes are donor funded. Social assistance schemes range from income support in terms of transfers in cash, school feeding programs, emergency aid in the form of transfers in kind such as food assistance and so on and so forth. Social assistance can be offered on conditional or unconditional basis. Conditional social assistance involves beneficiaries meeting specific performance indicators or targets to retain the access to the transfers provided as part of the social assistance scheme. Conditions may include in ensuring that children of school age are registered in school and maintain regular attendance. It may involve ensuring that the children attend clinics for vaccination. In some instances, especially in the case of public works, in other, work, in other words, workfare, you know, programs, payment is made on the condition that members of the household who are capable participate in public works program for a specific duration of time. Transfers may be in cash or kind, with the latter being in the form of food packages and so on. Unconditional social assistance schemes do not have any performance or target indicators attached to becoming or remaining beneficiaries. Social assistance in the form of emergency assistance is often in response to natural disaster events such as flood and earthquake that disrupt people's lives and livelihood. Emergency provision of food and shelter may be offered. As mentioned earlier, social protection can be defined to respond to vulnerability after the fact. In other words, exposed and designed to prevent vulnerability. Social insurance schemes that involve pre-planned prevention of poverty in old age involve, include a, a retirement scheme. Similarly, and not often considered as such, are agrarian support schemes designed to smoothen consumption throughout the, the year. Farm subsidy intended to support agricultural production is an example. Also, we have in some countries programs that involve farming households selling grains to marketing boards, but who at a later stage can buy back the grains from the marketing board at the same price they sold the grain to the board. In this context, the storage facilities provided by the marketing board constitute a form of socialized or collective storage for the farming communities. As we discussed in modules two and three, coverage and eligibility can be universal, employment-based, or targeted. The targeting itself may be through means test or proxy means test, including the use of communities to select those in the community that will, be, that will be beneficiaries. Access may be based on citizenship or residence. In cases of social insurance, access may be based on prior history of contribution or membership of the scheme. A vital aspect of a targeted scheme historically has been the principles of the deserving poor. In other words, it is not enough that people are poor in order to qualify, they have to be deserving in that they are otherwise not able to provide for themselves. 
in the context of the English poor law, deserving poor will be considered the impotent poor that may be eligible for public support because they are unable to provide for themselves through their capacity to live on. The norms of the deserving poor persist in the extent to which conservative policymakers can readily agree to offer public assistance to the disabled persons, children, and people in old age, but not for anyone of the working age that is considered able-bodied. The idea of the deserving poor also explains the demanding conditions that are often imposed on people to qualify for support. In Jeremy Bentham's infamous dictum, receiving poor relief has to be so stigmatizing as to make it, and I quote, an object of wholesome horror, as a way of dissuading as many people as possible from seeking relief. A more common method of stigmatizing social assistance is by requiring intending beneficiaries to perform their poverty, to queue in public to, in order to receive relief, requiring others to certify that they are sufficiently poor and so on and so forth. There are two dominant models of social protection currently in international so-called development circles. These may be referred to as the ILO and the World Bank models. The defining framework for the ILO social protection model is its Social Protection Flaws Recommendation 2012 document, referred to as Recommendation 2012. This was adopted in at the 101st session of the General Conference of the International Labor Organization in 2012. The recommendation draws legitimacy from the from Article 22 and 25 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights that affirms the right to social security. But in a different sense, the idea of a right to social security has its foundation in the originating mandate and inspiration for the ILO, which is the oldest of the United Nations agencies. Among the normative basis of the social protection flaws, flaw are universality of protection based on social solidarity, entitlement to benefits which should be prescribed in national laws, benefits being adequate and predictable, beneficiaries having access to be, to be the access has to be non-discriminatory, guaranteeing gender quality, equality and responsiveness to social special needs. Solidarity in finance while seeking to achieve an optimum balance between the responsibilities and interest among those who finance and benefit from social security schemes. Ensuring that social security schemes are coherent with national social, economic, and development policies, and ensuring coherence across institutional institutions responsible for the delivery of social protection in the country. The social protection flow which the ILO member states are admonished to provide a frame by what is described, what it describes as life cycle approach to social security. This involves access to nationally defined set of goods and services constituting of essential health care, including maternity care that meets the criteria of availability, acceptability, and quality basic income security for children, providing access to nutrition, education, care, and any other necessary goods and services. Basic income security for persons in active age who are unable to earn sufficient income, sickness, unemployment, maternity, and disability. Basic income security 
for older person. In all these cases mentioned above, the basic income security should allow for a life in dignity. In the context of Recommendation 202, the social protection schemes provide providing benefits may, to, and I quote, may include universal benefit schemes, social insurance, social assistance scheme, negative tax schemes, public employment schemes, and employment support schemes. In designing the social protection floor, the recommendation enjoined member states to combine schemes, benefit and services that prevent risk, promote the, the income earning capacity of people. In this sense, social protection flaw systems should promote productive economic and formal employment. The ILO placed an accent on ensuring coordination of the social security program with other program policies that enhance formal employment, income generation, education, and vocational training to reduce precariousness. Active labor market policies that ensure skill upgrading and training are essential components of a social protection flow. While the ILO envisages a situation in which a country may require international support in financing its social protection flow programs, it gives priority to funding the flow through national resources. This may require the principle of progressive realization of the right. Still, it will be important that a system of comprehensive and adequate national security system is built progressively and maintained. The social security system has to cover people in formal and informal economies, ensure that it aligns with national development plans, Subsequently, the ILO will, replace increase, will place increasing emphasis on ensuring the universal provision of and access to social security systems. In many ways, the ILO's social protection floor frameworks, framework and the focus on social security reflect the funding rationale and mandate of the organization. The conception of labor is primarily in the context of formal industrial employment and, urban context, and the urban context. The, pref the preference for income maintenance scheme is informed by its OECD foundation and the dominance of these types of scheme in the national social protection programs. In the largely agrarian context of many African countries, especially in the context of the Middle Africa, smallholder farmers dominate rural economy, which is home to a large share of the population. In such contexts, social protection intended to smoothen income and consumption of households may involve alternative policy instruments. This may include farm production support schemes supply of seed, fertilizers, etc., as at subsidized rate, and socialization of grain storage. In the case of the latter, farming households are allowed to buy grain back from marketing boards at the same price they initially sold their farm product to the marketing board. The intention of this scheme is to facilitate the smoothing of household consumption across the farming cycle, given that vulnerability is cyclical in, in farming context. While it has faced immense demonization under neoliberal regime, food subsidy and pan-territorial pricing of major consumer items were instruments used in many developing countries 
to address the vulnerability of their population. Instruments such as these and farming production support schemes are conspicuous for their absence from the social uh, protection scheme that the ILO put the social protection flow acknowledges. Policymakers in the context of development need to be open to a diversity of protection instruments that suit their local context beyond those acknowledged and recommended by international agencies. The World Bank's approach to social protection is within a framework of what can be described as stratified, segmented, and segregated social policy. What is inherent in the neoliberal that is inherent in the neoliberal social policy imagination. A stratified social policy involves a, a hierarchy of offerings, such as individual health insurance with different plans, you know, benefit options within the medical insurance scheme, attracting different degrees of financial costs and, and services. Stratification relies on the ability of the person taking up the insurance to pay for the options, reflects the hierarchies in employment and existing level of social stratification and inequalities. Segmented social protection frameworks tend to go with stratification. Social policy instrument that is so designed involves multiple and distinct pockets of programs or schemes. Again, the plethora of health insurance schemes are an example of segmented social policy. However, it is the segregated social policy instrument that segmentation, it is in the segregated social policy instrument that segmentation becomes more, most evident. Segregated schemes involves walling off social policy offerings for the vulnerable or the deserving poor. It is in the segregation of social protection schemes specifically for the deserving poor that the World Bank social safety net approach has its defining character. It stands in contrast to the accent on inclusivity and universal access that is a defining aspect of the ILO concept of social security or the unrest advocacy for universal social protection. While safety nets, social assistance schemes are often passed off as designed to reduce poverty, as we see in this slide, this slide here, um, social safety net, to quote the World Bank, a social assistance program are non-contributory interventions designed to help individuals and households cope with chronic poverty, destitution and vulnerability, end of quote. Safety net schemes are differentiated from social insurance in other words, contributory schemes, in that only with safety net schemes do individuals and households have a claim on the state for public support. The idea of such schemes being about helping people, individuals and households cope with chronic poverty, destitution and vulnerability is an important marker in understanding the design of the schemes. Their selection, in other words, eligibility criteria and generosity of offerings in terms of the benefits and services that they offer. While in the narrative of the new poverty agenda that dominates the international development community, safety net schemes are often presented as intended to reduce poverty and inequality. They are in, if, in fact about letting the poor cope with not poverty as such, but chronic poverty. The value of most safety nets scheme is often below the internationally defined destitution datum line. In other words, 
$1.90 per person per day. This is much less than the $3.10 in purchasing power parity terms in 2015 prices, that is the poverty, the international poverty datum line. Segregated social, pop, social, in other words, public support schemes require the beneficiaries to be demonstrably not able to provide for themselves. The selection criteria are often obsessive in seeking to remove what is called inclusion errors. In other words, leakages of benefit to those for which they were not intended and leads to very onerous selection procedure. Safety nets in the context of segregated social policy may involve conditional or unconditional cash transfers, food and other in-kind transfers, school feeding programs, public works, fee waivers, targeted subsidies, and a range of other interventions supported by public resources. The defining element is that eligibility is by selective method, limited to those defined as the deserving poor or vulnerable segment of the population. The social insurance schemes within the World Bank social protection imagination are primarily part of the segmented social policy framework and are managed through the markets. Like all social insurance schemes, they are contributory and quote, are designed to help individuals manage sudden changes in income because of old age, sickness, disability, and natural disaster, end of quote. In cases of retirement schemes, preference is given to contributions to individual retirement accounts, which are managed by private pension fund managers. Such schemes are defined contribution schemes. What you contribute is predetermined, but what you get out of it is a function of the performance of the investment of the fund. At maturity, the market-based schemes will require the purchase of an annuity from which retirement income is drawn. Unlike in defined benefit schemes, there is little or no risk pooling involved. In this slide, we summarize um, the um, an assessment of the competing models, which we've already discussed in uh, you know earlier in this uh, in this lecture, um, and this relates to the fact that the ILO model reflects its institutional mandate, uh, a life cycle approach to social protection and preponderance of the focus on income maintenance and support. And the World Bank approach reflects its neoliberal disposition, is grounded on the stratified, segmented, and segregated social policy approach, uh, the preference for private sector provisioning and management of social insurance. In other words, it's market-centric. Uh, it involves a restraint on the level of social support that can be expected through the fiscals, uh, which is in <clears throat> contrast to several OECD countries' experience. <clears throat> uh, and the, the, the idea of uh, poverty in, in, you know, uh, reduction here is really about helping the poor cope with poverty, with extreme poverty. Uh, chronic poverty and inequality uh, and, and, and vulnerability. Um, and, and the preference is for um, targeted provision of public support <coughs> in social provisioning. Often built into the safety net scheme is the principle of graduation. 
what beneficiaries receive support and are encouraged to graduate out of being recipients of the social assistance benefit or services. The paradox in the model of social protection that is offered to African countries and other global South countries is that both in terms of the efforts to limit the outlay from the fiscals to support social assistance and the idea of graduation, this is at variance with the experience and practice in most OECD countries. Public social expenditure accounts for more than 30% of the GDP in countries such as France and Finland, over 24% in countries ranging from Portugal to Sweden, Belgium, and Germany. In countries such as Norway and Sweden, social protection benefits transfers in cash, such as child benefits, are paid to households regardless of the income of the households. Even in countries with social policy regimes that are close to the liberal welfare regime variant, fiscal welfare offers a higher level of benefit than public welfare offers. For instance, uh, in, in Brazil in 2013, uh, Bossa Familia Social Assistance, in other words, public welfare schemes, paid $176 per annum per capita on youth and children that are covered. By contrast, those filing personal income returns, middle income households to the wealthiest, receive annual tax break for dependents at an average of $858 per capita. In South Africa, the tax ded deduction for retirement contribution for the 3.6 million assessed taxpayers was at the range of 50,636 rent per person per annum in 2018. This was more than two and a half times <clears throat> what people on older persons grants receive in the social grant benefits. Most important is the segregated, is the segregated social assistance scheme in contrast to nationally inclusive schemes, often creates an institutional mechanism that makes only a small portion of the population visible to the public social provisioning. The effect in the context of sudden outbreak of a pandemic is that most of the population is invisible. And the institutional framework for reaching them is limited. So let's look at the, some of the lessons from uh, the social protection responses, social protection for recovery of post COVID-19 by first looking at lessons from the uh, social protection responses to COVID-19 pandemic. The livelihood impact of the measure to mitigate the effects of, of the pandemic for both informal sector operatives that depend on daily revenue intakes and for employees in formal economy who are for long the pandemic represents an important stress test for the efficacy of social protection architecture in place. It also reveals the responsiveness of public authorities and creativity to respond to the pandemic. The social protection schemes are intended to protect against the vagaries of the market and the life cycles and respond to external shock such as the pandemic. Even where the impact of the health systems was milder than initially projected, the livelihood impact was more severe. This is particularly so for those in informal employment, uh, those located in precarious labor market, and those op operating in, in the formal economy itself. And those 
those in informal employment are usually the first to lose their jobs, even in the formal sector or who are unable to secure employment because of the downturn in business activities. The informal sector operatives who depend on daily income receipts for their economic, from their economic activities were particularly hard hit by the restriction on movements and large scale gathering. The level of informality in the economy will have implications for the share of the population affected. The extent to which a country's social protection system depends on social insurance or safety net, social assistance for addressing vulnerability will also matter. In social protection system that rely on a highly restrictive definition of the vulnerable population that will receive social assistance before the pandemic, the social registers that some countries relied upon for rolling out social support will be too restrictive in its coverage. More importantly, most of those who faced livelihood vulnerability because of the pandemic, uh, those in formal employment or informal sector operatives will not have qualified for inclusion in the social register before the pandemic. Often the result was a misalignment between the social register and the newly vulnerable. Even in cases such as Togo, where creative use of platform technology was, uh, was, you know, came into effect to provide social assistance, the share of those who those covered was small relative to the number that applied for assistance. Significantly as well, the norms of generosity of the transfers in, in cash as the predominant social assistance instrument will matter for mitigating the livelihood impact of the pandemic. Where the amount provided for individuals in social assistance is less than the nationally determined poverty line or daily or the daily rate is less than the price of a loaf of bread, the well-being of the vulnerable individuals is in significant jeopardy. The case of Nigeria is illustrative of the inadequate reach of a pre-pandemic social protection system that is based on the norm of segregated social policy. The date, the data on the slide is from the National Longitudinal Survey undertaken by the National Bureau of Statistics for May, August, and November, 2020. Among other things, the survey sought to determine A, the share of the adults in the population that went without eating for a, a whole day in the 30 days before each survey, and B, the proportion of the households that ran out of food in the 30 days before the survey. Against this, the surveys sought to determine the share of the population surveyed that received food assistance and cash transfer. The food assistance received was from all available sources during the pandemic. In other words, the government, national, states, and local non-government organizations, including and non-governmental organizations, including voluntary religious organizations and other social actors. The left-hand chart shows a significant increase in the rate of adults in a household that went without food for a whole day in the preceding 30 days and the households that ran out of food in the 30 days before the survey. The dotted line on the left-hand charts at the rate for both indicators of hunger drawn from the general household survey from 2018-2019 surveys. The share of the adults in the households that went without eating for a whole day was 25% in 
in May 2020, 33% in August 2020, and 18% in November 2020. Even the percentage share in November 2020 was more than double the rate in 2018 and 2019. The share of households that ran out of food was 58% in May 2020, 59% in August 2020, 48% in November 2020. In each wave of the survey, the rate of, the hu of hunger under the pandemic was significantly higher than the 2018-2019 baseline. Significant for the efficacy of the social protection response is the right hand chart on the slide. While in May 2020, some 58% of the population ran out of food, only 12.3% received any food assistance and only 2.2% received any cash transfer. The situation will become more dire in the remaining two waves of the survey. In, in August, while the share of the surveyed households that ran out of food in the 30 days before the survey increased to 59.2%, only 4.1% received any food assistance and only 1.2% received any cash transfers. In November 2020, while the share of the surveyed households that ran out of food declined to 48%. The assistance in kind and cash declined even more. Only 1.2% received any food assistance and only 0.2% received any cash transfer. This suggests an utter failure of the social assistance system to adequately respond to the challenges of the pandemic a failure that is a result of the norms and the design of pre-pandemic social assistance framework. The objective of a social protection framework, as we have argued repeatedly, is to protect people in periods of adversity and external shock such as the pandemic. A country's social protection framework will range from non-contributory transfers in cash and in kind funded from the fiscals to contributory social insurance scheme. A social insurance scheme such as medical insurance or pension or provident fund may be managed through the market-based program or in a non-individualized market framework. National insurance schemes are often managed under control of public authorities. Generally, it will involve a much larger pool of resources than in the case of segmented social insurance schemes. The degree of solidarity and, social and risk sharing built into a social insurance scheme will depend on whether it is market-oriented and managed privately or it is publicly oriented and managed by public authorities. In South Africa's case, the mitigation of vulnerability funded through unemployment insurance, a national insurance scheme offered a more generous benefit level than the social assistance scheme that was provided at the time. The amount paid out in social relief of distress, a cash transfer scheme specifically rolled out in response to the pandemic was 350 rand per month or 11 rand 66 cents per day. This is below the 642 rand per month nationally determined food poverty line or the daily price of a loaf of bread. While income support is essential in the context of loss of loss of income, such as under the restrictions imposed to control the pandemic, what the social assistance-based responses indicate are the antinomies of the segregated social policy. In the context of neoliberal politics and policy regime, 
the approach to social assistance, i.e. non-contributory public support for the vulnerable, uh, access was couched in the language of demonstrably deserving poor, extreme poverty and safety net. This approach to social protection is built on the idea that the primary port of call for securing social protection is the market. Healthcare is to, post, is, is to be offered based on private insurance for services provided by private hospitals or public facilities run increasingly on the model of modified private outfits. The so-called community-based health insurance schemes are offered to the low-income segments of the population on the presumption that they can, there can be no free lunch. Public social assistance is offered based on highly restrictive selection limited to the deserving poor. While sold as an anti-poverty measure, the core antinomy of such segregated social policy is that they do not even pretend to be about poverty reduction. The proxy measure of generosity that we employed so far has been to seek to match the benefit to the level of the cost of a loaf of bread, 500 grams per day. In each of the cases that we considered, the benefit level fell far short of the cost of a loaf of bread. An individual who is asked to subsist, subsist on a loaf of bread may not die of hunger, but the amount on offer cannot be considered sufficient for an adequate level of consumption, much less the need for housing and clothing. Yet, international and national agencies continue to celebrate what is in effect a grossly, not, grossly inadequate provisions to support basic, much less decent living. An antinomy of the segregated social policy scheme that the Bretton Woods institutions and donor bilaterals and multilateral agencies continue to sell to Africa is that it re results in an institutional vacuum. A population that is required to source its social provisioning from its market, from the market, or through family network does not require the construction of national institutional architecture necessary to respond to the adverse livelihood impact of a pandemic. Even in creative efforts such as Togo and South Africa, in other words, efforts to create new lines of income support, the countries have had to rely on non-social protection population database to identify or reach the population in need of assistance. A third antinomy of the segregated social policy is the extent to which it is informal sector blind. In other words, it is blind to the informal sector. While the informal sector is legible to economic and labor statisticians, it is blind to the national framework for social welfare support and provisioning. While it is understood that the adverse livelihood impact falls disproportionately on inform informal sector operatives, the key social assistance instruments such as used in, in contexts such as Nigeria and South Africa were ineffective for reaching informal sector operatives. The household empowerment schemes livelihood empowerment schemes uh, in Nigeria was not designed to cover informal sector operatives. When creative efforts were made to reach the sector, evidence suggests that the three country, in the three countries that we might consider, only a fraction of the population in need is rich. In talking of the informal sector here, we have in mind smallholder farmers as well. The subsistence needs of smallholder farmers depend on maintaining the supply chain of various services and commodities that will have been disrupted by the pandemic. Even with this relatively low health impact, a lesson of the COVID-19 pandemic is the need to transcend the regime of stratified, segmented, and segregated social policy that have been sold and vigorously imposed on the continent. Building back better 
in the post-pandemic post -pandemic context requires a fundamental rethinking of African social policy architecture away from segregated social policy framework. It will require a return to a more comprehensive social policy framework. Social insurance requires publicly managed national insurance schemes. A publicly managed national social insurance, as we see in the case of South Africa, is vital for protecting jobs and livelihood. This is antithetical to the neoliberal segregated market-centric approach to social policy limits. The lessons for the experience from the experience of the pre-pandemic system of stratified, segmented, and segregated social policy for responses to the pandemic draws attention to thinking beyond the pre-pandemic social policy architecture. The system of residual social protection that assumes that individuals will meet their social provision needs through the market also restricts the range of social policy instruments that is available to the to public authorities for the active effort at protecting the well being of, of people. Public assistance has been restricted largely to cash transfer, and such transfers are so low as to, to allow the poor to cope with poverty, poverty rather than reduce poverty. In addition to the active engagement with and use of a wider set, set of social policy instruments to protect the well-being of the population, there is a need for a higher idea of human self-worth that should underpin post-pandemic recovery, a building back that should be inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. The range of social protection instruments should include agrarian support mechanisms uh, to equitable access to uh, quality healthcare. The transfers in cash needs to be pegged to a level of adequacy necessary to meet a dignified living. What this points to is the need to transcend the prevailing system of stratified, segmented, and segregated social policy that has become dominant in most parts of Africa. What this calls for is a rethinking of the social, of the state society compact. This calls for repurposing the states and how the state thinks, underpinning the relatively poor responses to the pandemic is the pre-pandemic ways in which the state thought of its relationship with its citizens and residents. A state that thinks of its citizens and residents as a fiscal body will grudgingly do the least it can in protecting the well-being of its citizens and its residents. By contrast, a state that is actively engaged with its citizens and has a sense of obligation to a robust protection of their well-being is likely to secure the allegiance of its citizens and their sense of their obligations towards it. It is a state citizen compact that transcends the residual approach to social policy. Such a state is not likely to be is, is also likely to be more active in driving the developmental project of the country and least likely to take on the role of a night watchman state. The social protection, social compact that emerges between the state and its citizens and residents is fundamental for driving an inclusive, sustainable, and a re resilient post-pandemic recovery. What the post-pandemic recovery calls for is a shift towards a transformative approach to social policy, something that we will explore in greater detail in Model 9. Module 9. It is a take on social policy that seeks to undergird the development agenda and process with the enhancement of the productive capacity of people through public investment in human capital of the citizens and residents and pushes for the developmental imperative that makes human well being sustainable. The development process involving the structural transformation of the economy and society is one that is underpinned by an ecologically sustainable industrial capacity. This itself must be anchored in a robust investment in the national system of innovation. 
the development process itself has to be underpinned by the informalization of the economy and the expansion of productive employment involving decent, decent jobs. These have the additional benefit of improving tax revenue needed for supporting economic and social projects and expanding social insurance schemes in support of a robust social protection architecture. All the above need to be anchored on an active project of addressing gender inequities that underpin women's life chances, opportunities, and access to social services. A post-pandemic recovery will be nothing if it is not gendered, equitable, and transformative. Thank you.